Good evening and welcome to all of you. It's a great pleasure to share with you tonight about the concept of viscoelastic disc prosthesis. I would like to thank you for attending this webinar. I would also like to thank all the Spine Innovation team who organized it and finally the speakers. Due to, due to the sanitary situation, this is the first webinar organized by the GECO and Spain Innovation to replace the Le Mans GECO Congress. As the title suggests, this webinar will focus mainly on the basic questions that can be asked about an artificial disc replacement concept. I hope tonight you dare to ask the question you always wanted to ask. Firstly, I would like to introduce the three speakers. Marc-Antoine Rousseau. Marc-Antoine Rousseau is an orthopedic surgeon, the chairman in the Department of Orthopedic and Trauma Surgery at the Hôpital Bichat Beaujon in Paris. He did his thesis of, of physician doctors on the disc, artificial disc replacement in the RMT in Paris. So he uh, also did a fellowship in uh, San Francisco with uh, Bradford. It was a long time ago. And uh, he's uh, very, very aware in this replacement. He did a lot of studies in center of rotation. And uh, he's a great surgeon of this replacement too. Jean-Yves Lazenec. And Jean-Yves Lazenec is a senior orthopedic surgeon. He's also an, an, an anatomist, and it's very important to, uh, for the approach and for the, the surgery. He's, uh, he's working in the Department of Orthopedic and Trauma Surgery in uh, Hôpital La Petite in Paris. He has a lot of experience in this replacement, and he has also a great experience in uh, balance between this replacement, hip, and spine, and he developed a lot of, of um, ideas on it. I see on the screen uh, Didier Mena, who is the president of GECO. Hello, Didier. Thank you for coming to support us. Thank you. And finally, Svante Berg. Svante Berg is a very good friend. He's a great surgeon in Stockholm. In the, he's in the Stockholm Spine Center University Clinic in Linköping. I hope I have a good pronunciation of the Linköping. He is an associate professor at Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. He has a huge experience in this replacement because he started so, uh, this replacement 24 years ago and uh, he did his dissertation on comparative study between fusion and TDR. Then you see the panel of surgeons here is very huge and uh, with very experienced surgeons and you will have the, pot the opportunity to share with them and to ask them the good question for the, as you want. I think also it is very important to present our moderator, Patrick Tropiano. Patrick is head of department in uh, Latimon Hospital in Marseille. He is uh, vice president of the uh, French Spine Society. He, he, he is very well known, but what is very important for us today, he has a lot of experience for this replacement, mechanical, and then uh, viscoelastic uh, implants since uh, 20 years, uh, Patrick. Okay. Thank you, Jean. <laughs> now, uh, first of all, we have to uh, to start with uh, <clears throat> the agenda. Now you see the agenda. Then there is uh, three speakers. First one will be uh, Marc Antoine Rousseau with a topic on new generation of total disc replacement. Second one will be the Professor Jean-Yves Lasnek and with the topic, what do we know about biomechanics in viscoelastic disc replacement? And the third one will be Svante Berg with facet joint pain, main differences between viscoelastic and mechanical disc processes, preliminary impression from a Swedish CT study. Uh, before beginning this, um, pre those presentation, uh, you, I will just to, uh, to give you some information. You will be able to ask questions in the chat box. Your microphone must be remain mute. I'll be the one asking your question. You can send me your comments and thoughts in the chat box that I will pass on during the discussions. Now, I would like to invite you to vote just to get to know you better. 
the first question will be, are you already using these processes? Please vote. You have 15 seconds to vote. Well, the second question will be, if yes, for which levels do you use this replacement? Lumbar, cervical. Okay, and the third question is, which type of processes do you use? Mechanical or viscoelastic? And uh, now we can start with the first topic of Marc Antoine Rousseau. Okay, thank you very much, Patrick. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be connected with you right now. And I thank the organizers for the, for the webinar. So very shortly, the disc replacement, we replaced degenerative, de degenerative discs. And the normal disc is a very complex biological soft tissue uh, on the schematic on the right. What we had so far are articulated implants. Those are inspired from the implants that we uh, see currently in orthopedics, like hip replacement or knee replacement with ball and socket design as in a hip or uh, with a mobile uh, interface or nucleus in between as uh, the interlocking of a usual uh, knee replacement. Those have uh, friction couples and have been used for years. Here is a summary of the, um, the various models that have been proposed from the 80s on the lumbar and a little later 90s and 2000s for the cervical. The cervicals are basically the, the reduced models of the, of the lumbars. The mechanical behavior of those implants is related to the geometry of the um, surfaces. It has two, um, sorry, three to six, three to five degrees of freedom. On the left is um, an implant similar to a hip replacement. It has three degrees of rotation, three degrees of freedom. The implants on the right has a mobile uh, nucleus in between, and this allows three rotation and uh, two translations, uh, making five out of six degrees of freedom. The center of rotation of this type of implants is determined by the surfaces of, uh, the, um, of the interfaces. And the kinematics is um, based on the action of the muscles surrounding the implants. Uh, the implant act is acting actually as a, as a pivot and uh, all is ruled by the muscles. It's a passive kinematics. The elastomeric implants have a very, are a very different concept. First of all, it's a one piece implant. Once the implant is uh, integrated to the spine, it's uh, providing cohesion between vertebras. So it's a factor of stability. It's not like hip or knees that could dislocate if the muscles are weak or deficient. Here, the two vertebrae are linked and connected together permanently. The um, deformable implant has some viscoelasticity. That means that it's possible to come back to its neutral position. Um, and the degrees of freedom, since it's a deformable mesh, we, the, it has six degrees of freedom, including the vertical axis. And this may uh, make it possible to, to work as a shock absorber in a, in a vertical direction. And finally, the center rotation, since there's no interlocking parts, is free. So the center rotation is free. And the, this is, it has been demonstrated that such implants are less sensitive to, um, to suboptimal placement, specifically on the AP view, uh, since it's not like a, like a pivot. So all this is um, with a very nice list of properties. The thing is, is it true, is it a dream, is it real? If we go back from the official data from the literature, here are the papers regarding lumbar and cervical disc replacement from uh, of a second generation, namely viscoelastic. And all these papers, clinical papers, show that these implants are currently in use. And these papers are all from the last five years. 
Well, based on this official data, we are able to identify three main prostheses that are still in use, that are used currently in, in the patient uh, practice. The, the Freedom from Axiomed, first release in 2009, there are two titanium end plates and a layer of silicon polycarbonate urethane in between, which is um, uh, connected to the titanium by, uh, by some adhesive interface. Then the M6, M6 from Autofix 209, two titanium end plates. The PCU core is uh, surrounded by uh, polyethylene woven, woven fibers. And that's the, the braid of the fibers that keeps it together. The ESP on the right, from Spine Innovation released in 2005. The two titanium end plates, the silicon is surrounded by a PCU and the, the PCU allulus is molded to stick with the titanium. The cervical ones are very similar to the, the previous one. We have four models currently in use for this uh, second generation. Those are from two, uh, 2012 to 2016. And these are reduced models of the lumbar ones. The main challenge for this type of viscoelastic implants is the fact that it's a composite implant made of multiple layers. And each biomaterial, each layer, has its own modulus of elasticity. That makes it work, um, that makes it sensitive to uh, uh, fatigue testing. And the interface and the quality of the material is a concern that needs to be addressed when we go into this uh, type of implants. Because compressive, tensile stress, and shear are acting on the different interface. One interface in the bone titanium interface. As a technical aspect, we, uh, the, the bony end plate has to be prepared very clearly to, to stick with the prosthesis. And the, some have keels to um, improve the attachment to the bone. Uh, the ESP has a, has a coating of hydroxyapatite for uh, inducing biological connection to the bone. And the second, um, the second challenge is the junction between the soft material and the hard material. And uh, the, the three models that we have described previously, uh, one is adhesive bond, the other one is woven fibers. ESP has a specific way of molding the, the PCU and, and limiters uh, to um, which are the fabrication process uh, to um, to create this type of implant. So those implants are have been testing in vitro. Obviously, uh, these in vitro testing were performed by uh, independent labs, you know, uh, certified labs uh, before any human authorization, and those millions of testing and 40 millions of testing is way above what is mandatory to pass the tests. And this demonstrated that uh, it's like, like 20 years of use, there was no failure of the, of the lumbar implants that uh, I've described previously. The cervical implants were tested um, in um, various configuration to meet with the ISO criteria for standardization. And this shows that there is no degradation of the, of the materials, and that gives the, its own uh, modulus of elasticity at the end of the testing, and also the degradation over time. Clinical data, I'm not going into the results as uh, in terms of back pain or OSVS3 score. I'm just going into the results in terms of reliability, because clinical data is the final step of the testing. And these um, implants have been reported in the literature with a series over two years, even five years and eight years. And those series did not show any implant related complication in lumbar. Similarly, the, the, cervical, um, the cervical prosthesis were very reliable, at least in the, in the studies that were published at two years for all of the implants that I've described previously. No implant related complication in this reported series. So this uh, second generation has, is a biomimetic concept that seems to have much interest in terms of intervertebral cohesion and stability, elastic return and stability, and adaptive functioning regarding the center of rotation. The reliability so far uh, seems promising. So um, my, my basic question is, after this year 2020, which was very complex with the 
pandemic and the lockdown and the fresh start that we will have, we all have in two in 2021. My question is, what type of processes do you see uh, in 2021 for the reboot? Thank you very much for attention. I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, Marc Antoine, what is for you the most important characteristic of this prosthesis? Well, I think the most important characteristic is to, uh, to be very similar, as similar as possible to the normal disc. Because we've seen that um, the, the connection between the vertebrae are something that is a link and the bound is a, is a link that uh, in case of trauma, for example, or in case, of, in case of subsidence, then we need to have something to stick the vertebrae together to resist shear and the excessive forces. And I think we, we have with this, uh, with this coelastic prosthesis, we have the ability to, to handle that. And the second thing I would like to say about, about this is that it's much more permissive because suboptimal placement is not such a big deal since there is no uh, pivot in, in the functioning of the process. I think we can move to the next speaker is uh, Jean-Yves Lazenek with this topic. What do we know about biomechanics in viscoelastic disc replacement? <clears throat> Thank you, Patrick. Uh, this topic is, I think, very important because it is uh, this topic is about the difference between mechanical implant and viscoelastic disc implant. And now, as we have uh, follow up from 2005 uh, for lumbar spine and 2012 for cervical spine, we have a lot of data regarding the biomechanical characteristic. So I shall speak about what I know, uh, lumbar ESP on the left and cervical ESP on the right. Marc-Antoine explained very well the difference between the two implants and you have A as the uh, type of uh, 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 construct of uh, the lumbar and the cervical disc. You see, they have uh, limiters and they have a very special cushion different for lumbar and cervical uh, implants. But when we speak about uh, uh, cervical and uh, 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 lumbar disc, sorry, when we speak about cervical and lumbar disc, we have in fact to uh, look at uh, the sagittal plane and to look at the range of motion and the mean center of rotation. What does it mean uh, uh, for range of motion? It is sagittal rotation and uh, it is uh, very well, it has been very well developed for mechanical implant. We have also translation and we don't have a lot of data about this phenomenon of translation. And what is very important for me, it is a mean center of rotation. For cervical disc and for lumbar disc, it is the same topic. So when we speak about cervical disc, we use as a reference young asymptomatic cases. And I think it is dangerous because when you look at the vertebral rot rotation, the aim could be considered to be 15 to have 15 degrees angular rotation for flexion extension. Regarding translation, it is more reasonable to have, to speak about two or 2.5 uh, millimeter for translation. But if we look at the population of the patient we operate, you see that the range of mobility, which is expected is much less. In this small graphic taken from 200 uh, cases, you see that uh, the mobility, the range of angular motion for C5, C6, C6, C7, which, is, which are the level most operated in our experience, is much less than what is expected for young asymptomatic cases. So when we speak about range of motion, uh, we, have, we are able to analyze the different level. Here you have C3, C4, C4, C5, C5, C6, for example, for a C5, C6 ESP and C6, C7. And you have here the range between 12 and five degrees. You can say to me, this slide is too busy. So I look only at the C6, C6 ESP. And you see that uh, when you look at the follow-up for one year and two year uh, for a monosegmental implantation, we are in the range of what is expected 
in the population we generally operate. Same thing for C6, C7. You see all of the level in our implanted cases and the range 12 to five degrees. And you see, I suppress the busy part of the slide. You see, we are again in the range a little bit more mobile than what is expected for this population. Regarding translation, translation uh, you see on this graph, I hope the video will work, but I'm not sure. Uh, you see on, the, on this graph that the range of translation is about two millimeters for C6, C7, and a little bit more for C5, C6. Uh, what about the limitation of translation? You know that we have a limiter in, inside of the CPESP. It explains the limitation of translation. But, and I hope the video will work, it does not work. Uh, if uh, you uh, flex a CPESP, in some cases, you have, uh, of course, the ideal scenario. You have here the translation. And in some cases, sorry, and in some cases, you have this. You have, you see this on this model, on this reconstruction, you have rotation. So when we analyze the translation on the, our lateral view, we have some parasitic effect, which makes those measurements more complex. So what is important is to look at the mean center of rotation, which is the combination of this rotation and translation. All of us, we are accustomed to look at the mean center of rotation and on the right of the slide. And we don't speak a lot about the instantaneous center of rotation. Most of time, we analyze the global view regarding the center of rotation. And we know, as it has been published, that if we have more flexion, the center of rotation is higher. And if we have more translation, the center of rotation is lower. That's the reason why we put a lot of importance on the location of the center of rotation. Now, if we look at the degeneration of those patients, the, the degeneration of the patient we operate, you see the center of rotation is not the ideal center of rotation we have in young, sexy, asymptomatic patient. When we move from C3, C4, of course, we have uh, center of rotation higher, but we have a cloud of center of rotation higher and higher with the age and with degeneration. So when we want to analyze our center of rotation, we must take care of this value of degenerative uh, center of rotation as published in the literature. Now our cases. We know that we can analyze the center of rotation regarding x-axis or Y axis. But this slide just only to show you that we are able to calculate to the center of rotation of the other vertebra. It is interesting that I have no time to show the evolution of the center of rotation. It will be another topic. I make the slide less busy. And you see between 12 months and 24 months, you see the evolution of the center of rotation moving a little bit higher than the normal population because we have more flexion than normal population. So adaptation of the center of rotation. This is a case for monosegmental implantation, C5, C6. What about C6, C7? You have all of the cases, you have all of the cases, all of the level. I make the slide less busy and you see again that there is an adaptation of the center of rotation moving lower because of the, the adaptation with translation. So the big message at this stage for cervical disc is, of course, we have rotation, we have translation, but what is very interesting is to see the adaptation of the center of rotation with the time. You can say to me, okay, it is the case for Cervical disc, what about lumbar disc? I have a few minutes now, but I want to share with you this very interesting paper from uh, Wu, uh, exploring the impact of uh, proximodis proximodistal translation and AP translation when moving the spine from 
flexion to extension, the normal life. And we see that L5S1 is the level with the more Im importance of translation in the proximal, proximal distal direction, more compression. On the contrary, L4, L5 is a level of AP translation. So with the same implant, we must solve two different problems, compression and translation. And you see intuitively the interest of viscoelastic implant. Okay, you can say to me, it's theory. What about your true life with your implants? I shall answer, mean center of rotation is a key point. I want to share with you this publication of Tournier looking at the mean center of rotation, the cloud of mean center of rotation for L4, L5 levels and L5S1 level. You can see that for L5S1, the cloud of center of rotation is higher in some cases of normal patient, uh, the center of rotation is even inside of the level of the disc. You have seen that at the cervical level, we were fight, fighting to avoid the center of rotation inside of the level of the disc, but for the lumbar level, it is not quite the same. Now, uh, from a series we published uh, in 2019, L4, L5 level, I can, of course, analyze the center rotation regarding Y axis and X axis, but I think it is more interesting to look at the cloud of center of rotation. You have here for L4, L5, you see it's quite similar for uh, the L4, L5 level regarding the asymptomatic, asymptomatic patient and L5, S1 also. It is very surprising that we don't have discrepancies regarding the normal life of those patients. You can say to me, okay, it is for L5, 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 L4, L5, the level with more mobility and the level with more translation. What about L5, S1, the level of compression? Again, you have L4, 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 L5 non-operated level and L5, S1 operated level. And you see, you can compare, it is very intuitive you see that the, the cloud of the center of rotation is quite the same. Of course, you can say to me, it's very quick, a very quick presentation, but now we have the data. We have very precise data uh, uh, proving this. So my humil conclusion are, first, what are the prerequisites for optimization of this replacement? First, the reconstruction of range of motion. Segmental rotation, but segmental rotation of the patient we operate is not the segmental rotation of young, sexy, asymptomatic patient. We must also reconstruct segmental translation, but translation measurement we do are sometimes difficult to, for the interpretation because we have a combination of transverse rotation. Reconstruction of the mean center of rotation is something we must analyze but not regarding roughly all of the level, but independently level by level. And what is fascinating, I have no time to express this, is to see the adaptation of the adjacent center of rotation. And we see that by the time we have an adaptation of this uh, center of rotation of the adjacent level. So pro probably a possibility, a hope of protection of those levels that our patients have local and regional alteration. Posterior facet, Zwand will speak about this, and variation of sagittal balance. How can we imagine that with the same mechanical implant, we can solve the problem of lordotic cervical spine and the 30% of kyphotic cervical spine? The same uh, reflection regarding the lumbar level. So to date, those viscoelastic uh, disc replacement are very forgiving for the potential adaptation for range of motion and center of rotation. Personally, I can speak mainly about monosegmental implantation, but other colleagues, Van Baer, people from Germany, from Australia, have a lot of experience with multi-level implantation and hybrid construct. So we shall discuss about this, but 
we must consider that this presentation is a very humble presentation, a very uh, uh, partial presentation of uh, a very limited presentation of our result, but it can open the mind about the interest of this uh, type of implant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joey, for this very nice presentation. Um, I have a question for you. Uh, you said that this, uh, this uh, prosthesis is forgiving. You think then how, what uh, the level of set we can accept in this kind of prosthesis in case of misentering or uh, difference in uh, deep implantation? The first message is, it is not because it is a forgiving implant that you, may, you can accept technical errors, of course. Uh, regarding the cervical level, we must be very careful regarding the protection of the cushion to do the implantation with the two hand plate uh, very parallel to avoid lesion of the cushion. But uh, all of us, we know sometimes it is not very easy to be uh, strictly in the sagittal plane. When, you, when we look the AP view of our disc, sometimes we have some error of rotation. With a viscoelastic implant, it's not a problem. Uh, the same thing at the lumbar level. At the beginning of my experiments, I must say that I did some error regarding rotation. And it, we did not pay the price of this. Of course, we must try to be perfect. But if we have some error for transverse rotation, it will not be a problem in a certain limit of 10 degrees approximately. I think what is very important is to push the prosthesis at the lumbar level as posterior as possibly, not because of the center of rotation, not mainly because of the adaptation for the center of rotation, but to be sure that there is a good impaction of the prosthesis between the two hand plates. So it is forgiving, but the message is don't accept technical error, try to be perfect. Thank you for this very nice message. Before the topic of uh, Swante, uh, I would like to invite you to answer the question, have you ever had patients who had facet pain after disc replacement? Okay, thank you. Okay, Swante, it's your turn. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, I'm honored to be able to talk about this subject that interests me so much. Uh, to, to my history, uh, I might mention that I've done this for a long time. I'd like, I have nothing to disclose regarding this, um, either with the companies involved or anything else. My personal history started in the mid 90s with um, when I started using mechanical disc prosthesis. Uh, at that time, it was Tritean products that were available. Uh, as many of the followers, they were purely mechanical. They sure restored mobility, but not the counter forces uh, to mobility, that is the capacity of the healthy disc. They just made a lax, loose mobility. When we consider what type of patients we do our surgery on, uh, the patients uh, have been suffering from a long-term low back pain. When pain starts, there is a reflective contraction in erector spinae muscles. And after years of pain, they are extremely short and strong in these muscles. But not often in their abdominal counterforcing abdominal muscles. They also develop a fear of motion, keeping these muscles in their glutes and in the, along the spine on tension at all time. That is how the patients are when they reach us. So if we put in a mechanical disc prosthesis, there's a risk that the very short and strong erector muscles will bring them into segmental hyperlordosis. Um, on the, the case to the left, it's probably partly because the, the fusion that was done there was without any lordosis, but there was no counterforce in the mechanical disc 
So they tilted over and destroyed their facets. It was early obvious that facet joint arthritis was frequent in a cup, uh, after a couple of years of mechanical um, total disc replacement. We try to avoid uh, adjacent segment disease by restoring mobility, but then we had some patients that developed this instead. Uh, I started an extensive preoperative program to deal with these sh strong and shortened muscles and to uh, strengthen their rectus abdominis muscles to reduce this. And they had to do this uh, program for a full year after surgery. And the frequency of facet joint arthritis was largely reduced, but it was not eliminated. And it was very demanding for the patients. If they were not motivated, they wouldn't do it. And then they'd probably come back in a couple of years with problems with the facets. So I started to search whether there was a process that could help me with this. So it was not just the patient's uh, training and exercise that sacrificed them. So I started with the um, LPSP, the SAC processes, the viscoelastic one, almost five years ago. Theoretically and in practice, it would reduce risk of segmental hyperlidosis and in that uh, fashion, reduce the risk of facet problems. I did uh, quite a series of that processes and the results were so promising, um, both in outcome and especially on the facets. So I started a randomized single blind control trial with 250 patients. I'll tell you more about it. Uh, before the study, uh, I uh, did a lot of cases, as I said, in a series. And the results reported from the patients were very satisfactory, both in treating the low back pain, but actually avoiding coming back later with facet joint problems. Just some examples from, from this series. As you see, I always place them all the way back to the PLL, really to uh, distract or unload the facets. And also that is a very nice position for the processes. You don't have to worry about migration or things like that. This is just different cases. I didn't uh, done one, two, three level cases with this disc, not four level, then it's been a hybrid. So, uh, the randomized control trial that I started was an equal randomization in each group between, between the two best mechanical processes. In my mind, the peak on peak orbit processes and the best viscoelastic processes that I can fi could find the LPSP or as we call it, the SAC processes. Um, in the study, that it had to be maximum two segments to treat, not more cranially than three, four. I divided the patients into three groups, one segment cases, two segment cases, and hybrids. That is also two segment cases with one total disc replacement and one ALIF. Uh, and they were in each group, it was an equal randomization between the brands of disc processes. All patients had the same pre and post operative program by the same physiotherapist uh, and me. And that was the program that we developed when we just had the mechanical processes. The implant was blinded for the patients until the two year follow up. Uh, all patients are now treated. Last patient in March 20. That means that we have a lot of follow up to do. The follow-up is done by questionnaires from the Swedish Spine Registry at one, two, five, and 10 years. And then the, we, we register all spinal procedures in this registry, not only a study like this. I achieve uh, x-rays with flexion extension at one and two years. And after two years, I do a 3D CT focused on facet joint um, stress and mobility. 
the first publication from this study will be on the two-year results. So it has to be awaited some time. But what we've seen this far is that no patient in the viscoelastic processes group had so far reported any facet-related problems and no hyperlordosis have been seen on x-rays. And that uh, corresponds to my, my first series before the randomized control trial. Uh, we have had reports of facet-related problem in the mechanical processes group and segmental hyperlordosis has been seen on x-rays. Not a bunch, but some. Uh, uh, very few patients, but there are like two or three patients that with mechanical processes that have the quirking sound that they suffer from uh, because um, even if it's not painful, it's annoying. And you can always think, is it the processes or is it the facets that is making this sound? When using viscoelastic processes, we gain something. We gain a counterforce on mobility that is more natural than, than a true mechanical processes. But the stiffness of the implant is demanding on end plane strength. You have to check bone density carefully if in doubt. Uh, because my impression is that uh, this process is a little more challenging on bone, uh, on end plate strength. You have to be very careful when you prepare the end plate so you don't um, induce any, any harm to them. And you have to see too that the implant is all the way to the PLL as I mentioned, both for intended mobility and neutral load from the end plate uh, of the implant and on the bony end plate. Thank you. Um, now we can share the question from the panel. Uh, the first one was, uh, which characteristics differentiate these elastomeric prosthesis between them? Which do you think are most relevant? Yeah, I think it's very relevant to have something that is resisting to shear and that is resisting to external forces. Because uh, the, the fact that it's an active return, elastic return to the natural position. Is a, it seems to be a great factor of stability. And all of us here uh, seem to say the same thing, that it's going to protect the facet and remain uh, permissive to the center of rotation. Why the recommendation are not to use more than two disco prostheses? In France, we have to do only one level reimbursed by the institution. If we want to do two or three levels, it's in the, the patient has to pay the the device uh, there's no uh, no regulations on how many discs i can place um, it's more common sense and things like that uh, i've treated a few four segment cases but then i've always found one segment that is better off with an a lift so it's been hybrids with three three discs and one a lift to add something to the answer of uh, marc antoine i think it is very important to uh, divide those implants between the implant with limiters and implant without limiters. Because if we go back to the history, because uh, we worked a lot be before the market uh, uh, launching of those implants, we did implant with no implantation on human being without limiters. And in some prosthesis, you have the, high, the higher the prosthesis is, the higher the cushion is. And if you don't have limiters, if you have a high cushion, you have more mobility. And so uh, the mobility is divided between rotation and translation. And you see it has a direct influence on the location of the center of rotation. More translation, lower center of rotation. More flexion, higher. And in some cases, the center of rotation is inside of the disc, which is not correct, which in, induces, as Vante explained, uh, facet uh, joint pain also. So I think it is very important to divide, to oppose those processes. It is, the concepts are completely different. There was a question on uh, compliance from MRI and viscoelastic processes. 
um, obviously the titanium is going to do um, um, a problem with the MRI because we cannot see very closely to the titanium. It's like a blind spot. Otherwise, it's very stable uh, with MRI. There's no, uh, there's no big deal. I, I think if we want to check for the position, we need to go to a CT scan, yes. which would be more precise and uh, responding to the question that we may have after, uh, after uh, implantation. Okay, another question. Is it possible to do the replacement for other patients with osteoporosis? Um, I would avoid that. But at the same time, we know that to make a fusion on osteoporotic patient is also difficult to have the screws sit there. And But uh, a viscoelastic process is, as, as I said, is demanding on the end plate. So I, I think it's a bad idea to do it on osteoporotic people. If it's young people, uh, maybe you can find the reason for the osteoporosis and treat that prior to the surgery. I have no experience of cement augmentation, but I have seen colleagues uh, uh, treating a fracture and a prosthesis or traumatic cases for any reason with cement, uh, cases from Switzerland, for example. But uh, did you do uh, some cement uh, ad addition, uh, Patrick? I did some, uh, quite five or six cases I did. Yeah, and, I did. Uh, with good results. I did once in a patient with osteochondromatosis. And uh, the bone was very, very weak. And uh, I, I reinforced the bone with cement. For everybody, how do you treat the patient who show facet pain after TDR? Really, really, we don't face this problem. Exceptionally, we do... Uh, facet injection, but as, as far as I remember, I did not do any facet joint injection since three or four years. We have sacroiliac pain because those patients have also uh, imbalance, leg length discrepancies, they have other problem, but facet joint, I, I don't know what is the opinion of the other panelists, but I have no experience. My opinion, uh, as I've seen, some of it since my prolonged use of mechanical processes is that first, before they get structural changes, just have the pain. We try to intensify the uh, program to reduce segmental hyperlordosis. And if sometimes supported by uh, cortisone and local anesthetics in the joint to get them started, but uh, once they've developed facet joint arthritis, I would do a posterior fusion and just fix them and regretfully sacrifice mobility. The problem is the neutral position of the implanted patient. For example, at the cervical level, it is surprising to see mechanical implants. Some of them are immediately with local kyphosis or other are immediately with hyperlordosis. It is the same at the lumbar level. So they, if patient has hyperlordosis, on the X-ray it seems perfect, but in fact, they have a, la a lack of extension reserve. And probably it is what uh, Zwante says, those patients with neutral positioning with hyperlordosis, they have no extension reserve. So they try to, they, they try to push on the facet and probably it is, it is one part of the problem. Mm. Another question. What do you do in cases with anomaly of articular tropism? They, the, the facet joints are have been moving that way all the patient's life before they had the disc degeneration. And if we can get them physiologically moving again, the facet will just do the work as it did previously. But you know, Patrick, as, as me, probably you, you were shy regarding the indication when we had the facet joint problem. And progressively, because we were very careful people, we, we moved, we increased the indication. It's, it is my experience. At the beginning, I was very shy uh, with, I needed to have perfect uh, facet joint. And then progressively, I increased indication. You know, I think these rules, like the, the two level rules or these rules are based on data from the primary generation of facet joints that were articulated. And I don't, not sure we can apply them now with the second generation. Concerning cervical disc prosthesis, what degree of segmental degeneration do you accept? And which patient would you deny a disc replacement? 
at first, I think it is very important to see what is the sagittal balance of the patient. I think uh, we have a lot of patients with kyphosis. We dream of patients with lordosis, but 30% of the patients have normally uh, cervical kyphosis. And this is uh, the problem with a big problem with mechanical prosthesis and with uh, viscoelastic implant. They have the ability of self adaptation. I had no time to, to uh, share the experience regarding the center of rotation, regarding the sagittal balance, but I think it is a key point. And uh, I think the first thing I look for is the sagittal balance of the patient and the potential extension ability after the prosthesis. And after this, I have been also uh, very shy uh, regarding the, the level of facet joint degeneration and progressively I increased uh, the, the indication. But I think the key point is the sagittal balance. So what recommendation do you give patients regarding return to sports? When to return, which sports are advisable and which are contraindication? Personally, we wait for uh, three months for austere integration and creation of the hydroxyapatite, and then um, the muscles need to be back. So I would say four to five months for um, any sports. I've done a lot of elite athletes from Sweden, and they they are very keen to start exercising early, and we just hold them in a short reign. So we they do just the right things, and I get my patients not to do any rotations during the first three months. But when they're once through this, uh, there is no sport that um, I would keep them off. Very often they have no pain at the lumbar level. So patients want to, I think they don't say the truth to us. They begin a lot of sport activity before what we expect. But as uh, Swante says, I said to them, no rotation, uh, uh, lifting, everything is forbidden, but I think they don't always respect what we say. I try to ask the patient to wear a brace during uh, one month to avoid any kind of torsion. After all, I, I remove the brace after one month, but it could be interesting to maintain it more in uh, one month. Okay, another question. Do any of the panelists have experience with lateral base insertion of the LPESP versus traditional anterior insertion? We can do it, but uh, it's difficult and uh, you have to remove properly the disc. And I use, in fact, I have with uh, my uh, old device, I had um, like struts and I put the struts uh, at the anterior part and the posterior part of the disc and they give me the channel to put the, the processes. And I push it uh, just uh, like this, but it was interesting. But the problem of the, 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 the lateral implantation of this kind of processes is the disc removal. And it's difficult to remove all the disc and to be exactly at the proper place. And it is not, it, I think if we implant disc by lateral approach is different concept. For me, it's not the same surgery, it's not the same indication. It's difficult to restore the balance by lateral approach because it's difficult to center, it, center the processes. And uh, we use more X-rays by lateral than by AP approach. I think it's a, it's a trade-off to get rid of the vascular surgeon or something like that, um, yes, because it's, um, you can do it so neatly from front. Uh, and if you do that trade-off, you go lateral, you cannot expect to be that accurate mechanically as we'd like to be. For the LPSP, we, we have 10 and 12 height millimeters. What if you get the disc space distraction more than 15 millimeters? We decided to have this type of uh, sickness from the experience we had in our patient. So we did not develop more, but I think again, it is, uh, it is possible to have higher implant, but for all of the implants, the cushion is the same. This is a big characteristic of the prosthesis. To have higher implant, you have a thicker end plate. You always have the same cushion. It is very different from other viscoelastic implant. That's the reason why we, we were very interested in this type of implant. The mechanical characteristics are the same. So the resistance uh, of the cushion is the same. So uh, 
in my personal experience, to have more than uh, 40, mi uh, 40 millimeters, uh, 14 millimeters uh, distraction, in, in my French experience, no, I did not face this. I haven't, I haven't seen it uh, on my patients uh, either, and I have had extremely tall basketball players and this and that, and uh, the sizes provided have been adequate at all times. And in my mind, who suffers from one millimeter of lower disc than you had the year before? We all have it since we are grown up. So I think it's, um, it's more of a danger to over distract than uh, if I put a 12 and it should have been a 14, I don't think it's a big deal. Okay, now we have, uh, it's, um, it's over. We have to conclude this, um, the first webinar from the, the JECO and uh, the Spine Innovation. I would like to thank everybody, all the speakers, all the attendees to share with us this, uh, this evening. Uh, I hope you enjoy it and you have more information on viscoelastic disc replacement. And uh, you can uh, see the, 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 all the presentation on the website yeah, you have the take-home message from Marc Antoine Rousseau. The second generation TDR is one biomimetic concept and two reable imprints from Jean Vlasenek. Uh, Viscoelastic imprints are forgiving with potential adaptation for range of motion and center of rotation. And from Swantiberg, avoid segmental hyperlordosis, both by the choice of implant and full pre and post-operative regime. Thank you again. I, I hope that we, we have the opportunity to, to organize the GECO in Le Mans next time, next year. Uh, and uh, have you. a good evening, everybody. Thank you again for your, uh, to share with us.